Hi everyone, welcome back to the Move and Inspire podcast. Today I am chatting to Dan Morgan, who is a transformational coach. And Dan is actually one of my boyfriend's best friends who I haven't met in person, um, only on the odd Zoom call. But I, I was saying just before we started that I really wanted to get more men on the podcast this season. So I'm really excited to interview you and to hear a little bit more about what you do. So hey, thank Dan. You. Hey, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you so much. This has been like both of us. We've taken about 45 minutes to set up me in Bali, like trying to get this co-working Wi-Fi, everything going. And then you with your headphones and your microphone. Tech but we're business. here. <laughs> we made it. <laughs> we made it. <laughs> so, Dan, tell us a little bit about you um, and also tell us what a transformational coach is. OK, tell you. So I'm 30. Uh, I'm based in Worthing. And yeah, I'm a transformational coach. Uh, I spend all my time working predominantly one-to-one -one with individuals. Um, so to explain transformational coaching. So what I do is slightly different. I do what's called integrative transformational coaching. So as part of the packages that I put together, we do either a combination of transformational coaching then with some sort of wellness. So whether that's breath work or meditation or yoga or body work. And I combine the two modalities to create a package that best suits the person that I work with. So in terms of transformational coaching aspect, it really depends on the person. And we effectively transform one aspect of their life. So that might be relationships or their career or their confidence or belief systems. So it really depends on the person. And then we work on their chosen aspects. So when, when you um, start with a client, is it normally you who works out that one aspect or or do they sometimes come to you and say okay I really need to work on self-worth so both so often what happens when I work with people is we always have like a an introductory um, I don't want to use the word consultation but it's the best thing I could describe it as we have a two-hour coaching call and sometimes people will come with very specific outcomes in mind they'll say hey Dan I'm here at the moment, I'm in a job I don't like and I wanna leave that job and start my own business and uh, move to Bali or whatever. And then the process that we go through then will be specifically designed to help them get from A to B across a specific time period that they have in mind. Other times people just come to me and they say, something feels a little bit off or I wish this could be a little bit better or I wish I could feel this way and it's a little more abstract. So I have some clients where they come with very specific goals in mind. So it's what I like to call um, horizontal coaching or A to B coaching. Um, and it's very uh, outcome driven. They, they come in at point A and they wanna to get to point B. And then sometimes I get people that come in and want what I call vertical coaching, which is often what you call deeper transformational coaching, which is where we're looking at belief systems, narratives that they may have that are outdated, outdated and this sort of stuff. Um, but in my experience, usually what happens is the people that come in for A to B often go on a vertical and the people that come in on a vertical often move A to B. So it, it always ends up being, um, yeah, a combination of the both. Sounds like such an interesting process. Is it something that you went through yourself? Like, did you, is this, did you have a big transformation and did you also have a coach helping guide you through it like what made you decide like I this is what I want to do for other people so numerous numerous transformations um so my first one so I was well I am a musician um and a singer and songwriter so I was in a band for many years and and that was my my thing was was music um and then at the collapse of my band which uh <laughs> would be another cliche story to tell of, of band breakups but it, it it went horribly um, so in that process for a long time, I lost four of my best friends. So for anyone that's, um, I, I'm sure everyone that's listening to this can imagine it's like having a, a family, a separate family or a, a group of best friends. So when you go through the breakup of a band, dependent on how that, that breakup goes, <laughs> it's also like breaking up with four of your best friends. So that in of itself was a, a real shock to the system after, well, my whole life doing music and six years with that band. So uh, I ended up becoming a promotional events manager for, for the uni that I went to, which was like a specialist music school. Um, and I was doing it because I was still kind of holding on to wanting to be in the music industry and keeping my hand in, in some way, even though it didn't really feel 
right. Um, and with that came a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of late nights and a lot of drinking and a lot of things that weren't really uh, aligned to me, but it was part of the industry. So it was something that I did. So the first wake up call was when I was like, this isn't right for me. I need to do something for me. So I went and did my first yoga teacher training in Costa Rica. Um, and I guess my first transformation happened there when I realized that I'd been living a very unhappy life for, for over two years post band. Um, and I came back, I said no to a promotion in that job role that I had, um, funnily enough to move to Brighton at that time. Uh, I said, no, it's not what I want. I moved back in with my parents and I decided to, to go after the, the full time yoga teaching gig. Um, so my first teacher and coach really in that regard for a transformation was, was the lady that led that training and husbands. So Marion Wells and, and um, Ron. So they were my coaches in some regard for, for that transformation and all the people also that were on that training with me really facilitated my first change. And then when I came back, that's when I hired and met like it was an accidental meeting at a gym that I met my first coach who I then worked with for the next two years whilst I built my business uh, as a yoga teacher. So the, the initial transformation and unhappiness and deciding to do something about it was triggered by me thinking this isn't right. Then it was facilitated by all the lovely people that I met on my training. And then when I came home and per chance met this coach that I met at the gym, um, he then really helped facilitate the growth of my business and direction. And I was looking up to a lot of people, you know, like Keenan McGregor and Dylan Werner and Patrick Beach and Dice and, and all of these amazing people traveling around the world teaching yoga. And I was like, wow, I would, I would love to do that. That feels like something I want to do. How could I possibly do that when I'm living at my parents' house in, in Cardiff? And I, at the time I had three jobs. I was, um, I was working in a cafe seven days a week. Um, like shift work and then I had a Saturday job at an estate agency and then around my shifts I was teaching early morning yoga or in the evening um, and eventually through working with him it became more yoga and then less cafe until eventually it was full-time yoga um, and I had aspirations to you know to become an international teacher or to lead a retreat and all these sorts of things and through that process of working with him uh, I, I did everything that I said I wanted to do um, and it was through that process I was like wow there's really something to to this coaching stuff <laughs> I would love to be able to offer that for someone else and I knew it really supported the work that I was doing for myself in, in my yoga practice um, it, it brought what felt like a more active component a more proactive component in in the world outside of being on a mat um, that really allowed me to bring the two practices together and, and that was the start of me realizing that there was something big to share in the combination of different modalities that really support each other. I had quite a similar thing, actually. When I started yoga, it, um, it, it was basically the same time as that I was doing a lot of therapy. And so yeah. yoga made so much more sense because I was doing the therapy and I was being taught about mindfulness, things that I just had no idea about before. And I think, yeah, that having both is like such a great way to open your mind. And also for me to understand the spiritual side of yoga a little bit more, because again, it was like this new thing, like what is Shavasana? Why are we lying down at the end of a class doing nothing? Why am I not out the door? You know, and then understanding like, oh, but this is a moment I could be mindful and check my breath and stuff that I was learning in therapy. So yeah, I can totally relate with that. Um, yeah, having both things is, is really, really helpful. So yeah. um, something, oh, go on. No, I was just going to say it's the, what's lovely is the embodied practice of yoga. And like you were saying of, of moments, moments of stillness and checking on your breath and being really present with where you're at, at a given time is, is very much heavily supported by the coaching process in that <laughs> the coaching is just basically a big mirror for, for everything that you, you want to see and everything you don't want to see. Um, and I think that if you come to the practice of yoga with the same intention, it will show you a lot. Um, but what's great with, with having a coach or going through the coaching process, then you can't hide. You can't hide from the stuff that comes up or you can't 
bypass it or you can't work around it. Um, if you choose to go headfirst into the coaching process, there's someone else there <laughs> in front of you holding the mirror um, that's saying, well, hold on, you're, you're ignoring this little piece over here or why don't we explore this or where would you like to, to go with this? Um, so that, yeah, just echoing what you were saying about the lovely combination that they both, they both bring lovely elements together that um, they work very synergistically. It's, it's a great thing. Yeah, and actually the whole one-to-one -one process as well, for me, that's been like so transformational. I think when I was first doing yoga in a, with a group of people, I really always wanted to hide. And actually hiding is not my true personality at all. But at that stage, I really wanted to hide. I was super anxious, I'd just been signed off work, struggling with um, anxiety and insomnia. But as you said, like when you're one to one, you you don't have anywhere to hide. And if you have um, someone who you work really well with, like for me, I had a very gentle therapist who brought everything out in the most loving, sympathetic, brilliant way. Um, and since then, I've had so many mentors, like it's basically all I spent my money on is just like coach and mentor and then a new mentor. And I'm always looking for new people and and just echoing what I said at the beginning about wanting to talk to more men I actually have um firstly a meditation teacher who's um male and I've booked in my first kind of call, coaching I suppose kind of coaching call I'm not sure what you would call it with him um for next week and then I've had a uh, like a male therapist for years and years and that's been so helpful for me to have both sides because i know that you don't just coach men you also coach women yeah pre predominantly i coach women um as, oh, it, as, as as my current roster would would um show at the moment it's predominantly women um yeah i think i think experiencing um facilitated work um from both sexes is really really important like you're saying it offers different approaches and different lenses and what you're saying as well about the the process that you you went through with your first therapist and how they were very gentle and how they gradually coaxed whatever you needed to share out of you and that's what i love about one to work uh, one to one work is really developing a relationship with someone and facilitating the experience that they need um so meeting your client where they are rather than coming in with an agenda and that that's a big thing in coaching is slightly different to mentoring is that we don't advise um, and it's very non-advisory. So if someone comes to me, for instance, and they want coaching and mentoring, it's always a very clear recontracting moment within a call of, okay, I'm going to take my coaching hat off now and I'm going to put on my mentoring hat. Um, so yeah, it's off the back of an initial coaching call of really listening, <laughs> of course, and hearing what it is that the person is saying and what they need. Um, and then across the initial few sessions, usually you're establishing a dynamic that feels right for the person, for the person that you're coaching, so that that sets a, a really strong foundation and emotional scaffolding for them to feel like they can share what they need to share and for it to be met in the way that they need to be met. Whereas within, within a group setting and, and group coaching, or for instance, in yoga, it's, very much doing the best that you can to speak to every single person that's that's there in front of you um, and i think that in some regard then it's somewhat diluted um, in that it's impossible to to be everything for everyone <laughs> especially in, in an hour um, so i think that's why i love one-to-one -one so much is that you really build a fantastic relationship and you create a, a working dynamic and relationship that really suits um, the direction of the, of the working period between you both. So um, it sounds like a little bit like you um, moved away from yoga and went more into the coaching side. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so... So I've not moved away from yoga. So I, I still practice myself. I still teach. Um, what's, what's changed is what's at the forefront of my offering. So whereas before it was um, Dan that does yoga, 
that is also a clinical massage therapist that is also a coach that also has these other these qualifications and tools um and what i realized on a lot of reflection and through through the process of teacher trainings um and leading teacher trainings and leading retreats and this sort of stuff is i realized that across the whole of my my journey with this stuff is that i've always been a leader and a mentor and a coach um and the shape that that's taken has been different but the conversation running parallel to it all has always been the same thing um so what's shifted is that i am a coach that has a host of other skill sets that i can bring to the table if that's what the person requires so that's what the shift has been um to speak a little bit to it i became slightly disillusioned with with aspects of the yoga industry um and i recognized in myself that um, some of what I was sharing and what I was practicing wasn't really um, aligned to why I began the yoga practice in the first place. Um, so pretty much I, I got fairly well known with, within the audience that knows me for being handstand Dan, basically. Like Dan, Dan teaches you handstands and arm balances and this sort of stuff. Um, but the reason I came to that practice was I loved seeing the transformation. Um, <laughs> in danger of being cliche with with transformational coach right but i saw the change that people went through in in the process of a weekend of workshops of coming in absolutely terrified and not knowing how to deal with their fear and it being paralyzing and then across the course of a weekend with various exercises and drills and partner work of then completely transforming how they saw themselves and the capacity and their capability and leaving at the end of two days feeling confident with going upside down um and then the impact that that then had on their life as a whole of, well, if I thought that I couldn't do this and I've been telling myself I couldn't do this for years and years and years, and now within the space of eight hours across a weekend, I'm, I'm now doing it. Where else is, is this true in my life? Where else am I telling myself I can't do something in an actual fact? There's just a story here that's, that's telling me I can't and I'm listening to it. So I started to see these different pieces pop up. Um, and I realized that, that's why I came to the practice was, was to look inward. And I found myself battling with having to deliver a specific type of practice in order to make money and in order to, in order to continue my career as, a, as an international yoga teacher traveling around the world. Um, and it was, it was interesting to watch the resistance that I got met with when I started offering slightly alternative offerings that were maybe more somatics based or slower or um slightly alternative to my normal offering um and it's like hold on you're not you're not the slow somatics guy you're the you're the handstand dude um but i mean i found my audience within that as well i, I managed to do it but what i recognized it was it was a nice wake-up call for me of hold on i'm being pigeonholed into something that is only one aspect of, of what i want to share how am i going to broaden this how do I do more of what I love and then bring in those pieces? So I still teach handstand now and I absolutely love it, but it's not the only thing that I'm known for and the only thing that I have to do. Um, so that, that was it from a business context. And then on a personal level, yoga became the only thing. Um, and all the ideologies that crept in around it of the, you know, the, the person that I needed to be and you know, Yogi Dan and what comes with being Yogi Dan and what's expected of all of that. Um, and then I completely gave up a lot of other things that I'm interested in, like the gym and, and MMA and pretty much any sport outside of yoga. It was like yoga is the way and the only way uh, and led to two or three serious injuries um, physically because I was overdoing effectively stretching. Um, and again, that was a wake up call of hold on what's happened to all of the other things that I used to enjoy that gave me a more robust body. Um, and gradually those things have been invited back in with open arms so it's yeah, it's come full circle now yoga is a part of who I am and and what I practice and it's part of what I share but it's not the only thing hopefully that answered yeah. your question in a meandering way no it it was um very clear and I think um made me think about lots of things uh, I think it's quite a common journey for a lot of yoga teachers um going really hard into let's say like a really fast dynamic yoga practice and yoga teaching like that's what I wanted to do I wanted to copy my teacher and then 
out of it came so many other avenues um but also yeah that it just reminds me of balance like just because we practice yoga doesn't mean we can't practice other things like strength training is just brilliant for people who are doing a lot of yoga because as you said you you've got injured i've been injured so many <laughs> yogis are unfortunately injured so i think um I, yeah i talk a lot uh, about this with jay as well like that that sense of balance like not having anything at an extreme yeah and i think sometimes yoga can be this breeding ground for massive extremes yeah um so um just moving back into like the the coaching side of things mm -hmm. i I firstly I'm really enjoying your Instagram videos I took a little deep ah, dive you. last week <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much and um there's one with you uh, taking the last piece of chocolate and having yeah. chocolate all over your face <laughs> yeah so let's talk about conscious communication because it's something that I am really fascinated by and mm. really trying my best with within all my relationships um yeah just any thoughts around conscious communication what has been really helpful for you and maybe you could give an example of like a particular circumstance or a particular relationship that might have been tricky that you yeah of course use this. Um, so it was taught the the big turning point was actually on on the on the first coaching training that i did and um they really started talking about obviously the importance of language um, and it was more an application for how you you speak about yourself. So being really careful with with your language around, um, yeah, how you talk to others about yourself, how you talk to yourself, um, and really connecting to the impact that that can have in terms of developing stories or belief systems that um, are going to negatively impact you. And then they started to speak more and more. Well, if this is the impact that it's having for you, one to one with yourself internally is what's the impact that it's going to have with other people. Um, and part of the course that I did was exploring what's called the drama triangle um, and how our behavior, whether it's verbal or our body language, can trigger a response in another party or parties, dependent on the situation that you're in, whether it's one-to-one -one or a group. Um, and it was just very interesting to, to look at that dynamic of we're wanting to stay in what's called the adult where you know we're a, we're measured and we're not ego driven, we're not um, emotionally charged, we're very balanced to use the word of the day, right? And then often where we find ourselves is in one of the three uh, one of the three, yeah, I guess corners of the triangle is persecutor, rescuer, um, persecutor, rescuer, victim, right? So persecutor, rescuer, victim, and then dependent on where the other party is positioned themselves in the triangle is more likely to trigger a certain response from you. So you're either going to be an overbearing or a critical parent, or you're going to be a rebel child or a, um, a submissive child. And it will take the shape in you moving into one of these spaces. So we did a whole module on a lot of this uh, communication work and trigger work and how you can recognize when you find yourself in a triangle or recognizing the behavior of someone being in the drama triangle and how to step out of the triangle back into the adult. So it was, it was that whole learning process that made me very cognizant about how I was talking to others um, and what emotional headspace um, I was in when I was, when I was delivering or saying what I was saying. Um, and since then, any, any relationships I have with friends or with my partner, Eve, fantastic mirrors for, for, for recognizing when that comes up. So the whole chocolate video was kind of a lighthearted touch on that of recognizing me in that moment of slipping into basically behaving like a child um, in, well, you took the last piece of chocolate. That's not fair. Blah, blah, blah. I'm going to take that. I'm going to take my unhappiness out on you now with my language. Um, so yeah, to, to the short version of this was it began on my coaching course that was when I first became very aware of the power of communication both, both positively and negatively and then everything since it's like seeing behind the curtain of now it's like oh yeah I'm, I'm, I'm in the triangle again it's time to step out um, 
it's just that awareness that as soon as soon as you start having discussions about non-violent communication or conscious communication it's you start to see it pop up in your own language so much more and it's like a constant check-in with yourself um, and also recognizing the behaviors in other people around you um, it's very interesting yeah did that answer your question yeah out of interest um because i'm yet to to meet evie is she interested in like in all of this like is this something she works on um or is she like don't you coach me dan <laughs> when you're in a, <laughs> like, a conversation or like yeah how does that play out um both i would never coach you um yeah and she does say that like if she if she if she gets a sense of me kind of stepping into to coach mode she's like nah um you're not you're not going to be my coach um so she she checks me on that firstly i would say but no she's very much into all of this and she does so much self-work um so it, it makes it a lot or very easy for me as a partner um for us to have these conversations in in a healthy way and in a way that really nourishes and supports our relationship so it's great she's very she's very interested in me sharing sharing my coaching stuff <laughs> but as her partner not as a coach right so it's like oh i was reading about this thing today what's your thoughts on that and she's like oh yeah i love that that's great whereas if i came in and i tried to do the whole coaching piece on her she sh shut it down in an instant but yeah hopefully again that answered your question she's she's a um she hosts women's circles um she specializes in women's and pregnancy yoga so she's very much in this space as well just in a slightly different area to me yeah, that, that definitely makes it a lot easier for sure. Yeah, um, for sure. Speaking about conscious communication, about how family are often a, a fantastic uh, group of people for you to start recognizing how all of this stuff pops up. It's like, I was going to say that basically, if you want to know what your triggers are, and if you want to find yourself in in good situations to learn to practice this stuff you're always gonna you're always gonna be able to do that around your family if you think you've got your shit figured out go home at christmas and try not to have an argument um at all and it, yeah it's um i really love for me for me being with jane knowing that he's got like you and i would say two to three other super super close guy friends and i know that when you guys get on the phone like that's you gone for two to three hours like you really schedule great time and you yeah i feel like you just have this really um wonderful male relationship that i think is actually quite rare i don't know if um you have anything to like add to that in terms of your other male relationships but it's something that for me as a girlfriend it feels really good because it's like okay he's got his people he can go to because <laughs> I think mm. often men don't have that and I actually haven't necessarily had that so much in relationships before so it's an it's a it's a great feeling to know that your partner is really supported by other people yeah for sure um <clears throat> that completely resonates with me I love that I have people like Jake in my life um and yeah I have a, a good a good group of men that I know I can any of them I could call up and have those interactions with but funny enough I was I was talking to Eve about this last night in that so many men don't have that they they don't have friends that they can call up and have those deeper conversations with it's all always very surface level to some degree um and that's something that's very important to me and um, you know Jonty. So me and Jonty are currently in the process of setting up a men's circle for, for that very reason is that we we both feel that there's not enough men's facilitation work or men's groups out there in the world where you're providing a space and a, and a community of other uh, like-minded men that are there for one another to have those more challenging conversations and those more supportive conversations and I think it's so important and, and like you said knowing that Eve attends and facilitates women's circles that she's got fantastic friends that she can also call up and and receive that support because there's some things that she would probably want to express and share with other women before coming to speak to me about it um, and I completely respect that that I'm never going to be her first port of call for every single challenge or issue that she experienced in her life. 
Um, I know that she will share all of it with me at some point when she's ready to, but I think for her to know that she's got other women in her life that she can go and share whatever she wishes to share with them, I think that's very, very important because I think if the pressure is placed entirely on your significant other, it can bring a lot of uh, a lot of weight to a relationship that isn't necessary. Um, because then that person becomes your sole bearer for good news, bad news, everything. Um, and that can, I, I, I feel can create a fairly toxic environment um, for a couple. Yeah, Esther Perel talks about that a lot, like not asking your partner to be your lover, your financial advisor, your soulmate, your best friend, your just everything. Um, 100%. And I think, it, yeah, that just really moves towards like a, yeah, a healthy, um, more balanced, as that is our word today, <laughs> relationship. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah it, was, it, requires, it requires a lot of shifting gears and um, adopting different headspaces and, and outlooks requires a lot of energy. So if you have to play all of those roles for your partner, um, it can feel like you're never playing the role of of just being the boyfriend or the girlfriend, right? You're the you're the coach or you're the financial advisor or you're the savior or you're you're the, the chef or the this or the that. And very spending very little time as the role of, hey, we're just two people that love each other and, and enjoy each other's company and a lightness. If you're playing every single role that exists, there's always a, a lot of weight on the relationship. Yeah, and um, something that I actually ex explored in one of my interviews with my male meditation teacher, I was asking him about like maintaining desire in a long-term relationship. And like one of the main things is don't ask them to be your everything because otherwise you're each other's like moms and brothers and sisters, you know, it's like not the relationship that is gonna help you have that desire and that excitement when you're, let's say, living together all the time. Um, yeah. so I do think that's, that's really interesting. And also, again, another really good thing I think for, for people to talk about is, um, that that's can be really difficult in relationships. I think in our heads, we're like, oh my God, every other couple is having sex like 10 times a week. And, you know, you're like worried about your relationship. And actually, again, if we can share these things, um, yeah everyone goes through difficulties with with desire but that was definitely something that stood out for me of like try not to get your partner to be everything yeah it's um i obviously can only speak speak for myself and, and loosely without without naming names uh, with clients but, but i think that that's the realization that a lot of people arrive at when they find themselves in a relationship that's that's great and that serves them and you know will have its ups and downs but they realize that they're in they're in a fantastic, loving, nurturing relationship. Is that in hindsight for me to look back, all of the the relationships that I was in prior to Eve that that went wrong or went south or didn't quite work out, was I came into the relationship with an expectancy of them needing to be something for me or vice versa, stepping into all of these different roles rather than us coming together as two individuals that recognise we've got our our own stuff and how to handle our own stuff and being very transparent and communicative about our stuff and supporting each other, but not placing that stuff on the other person and expecting them to be the, the fixer of it all. Um, yeah, and it's and in doing the work that I do now with coaching of expectancy, pretty much, it can be very damaging um, for many things in our life. If we come in expecting things to be a certain way and expecting someone to be a certain way or to fulfill a, a specific role, that yeah it can have it can have detrimental impact and then placing outside expectancy of what a relationship should be right the shoulds of sex 10 times a week and you know date night every day and and you know never argue and and all of these different things and like couples that work out together stay together and like all of this stuff you see um <laughs> the, ho the holiday romances on um, on instagram i think yeah it just perpetuates all of that massively if people come into relationships thinking it's going to be all roses and then get hit with the reality of life that we're all incredibly complex and that no one's going to truly understand 
you as much as you understand yourself and expecting them to is is a recipe for disaster um i love how this is going in so many different directions um i want to go back to family and yeah. um something that i also um noticed from one of your instagram videos um was uh about adopted behave behaviors and yeah. trying to get to the root of like understanding is this belief my own or is it something mm -hmm. that i've learned through my family so i want to ask you how do you how do you figure out like is this belief behavior something that's true to me or is this something that i've literally just um inherited from from someone yeah. from a caregiver great question um so yeah interjected beliefs and behaviors are, are really really interesting i say the biggest thing that um someone could do without a coach or a therapist would be to look at their values and to to do a deep dive on on what their values are present day and what i found through being coached and coaching is that that needs to be a regular checking in process because they shift so regularly um so when we start to explore value systems and we start to see what in our life aligns to them or doesn't align to them that's a great starting point of like hold on <laughs> i'm in this job that doesn't align to any of my values where's that come from and then we start to look at the belief systems that support that of like oh you need to have x job because why you need to be in a nine to five because it's important to have security and it's important to have a regular paycheck and your job isn't everything you can enjoy yourself on the other two days of the week right and then you can start to dig into well where did that belief system come from um and then often you can start to explore a little further then in well what what was i being told at an earlier age about how things should be and how the world should look and how I should behave. Lots of shoulds. So look at your shoulds, again, is another thing. When you start to explore your sentences around how things should be, you also start to see then whether or not these are learned narratives or learned behaviors or learned beliefs um, that you've inherited as, as you've grown up through life. Um, having a coach, and this is gonna sound very coachy of me, but having a coach is very useful because as i said they provide a mirror and they ask great questions to help you start to see actually what well, do i think that is is that something that i do believe because my actions would say otherwise so when you've got someone pointing out the flaws in what you're saying versus what you're doing or, or vice versa or how you're behaving you then start to see the inconsistencies between what you say to yourself what you say to others what you do what you don't do um what you believe what you don't believe um, also having a therapist helped me personally unpack a lot of what shaped my outlook in life um, and then compensatory behaviors around that. Um, so I use a model with my clients. Um, it's called BEAM and it ties into aspirational self. So it's B-E-A-M and it's behavior, environment, aspiration and mindset. Um, often what we discuss is that mindset informs behavior or vice versa and then they inform or create the environment that you live in um, so when we look at well what's what's the outlook that I've grown up on is that actually making me the person that I wish to be in the world is that um, creating opportunities for me to do what I want to do in the world and so on versus well who is the person that i want to be how do i want to think how do i want to feel and that might not even be i want to be a millionaire that you know has a yacht it's it's not necessarily aspirational in terms of what you achieve or have it could just be a feeling of how you wish to exist in the world and then well what would the mindset of that person be what would the um the behaviors of that person be to create the environment that you wish to live in so often when we highlight what the unhappinesses are in our life or the areas of um, suffering or struggling they often highlight a nice disparity between what we actually want and what our reality is and then doing the work to start pursuing or 
making the changes needed to live a more aligned life. So that's why I began with values is the first step is awareness of, well, what is it that I actually want? If I remove all of the noise around me from what other people are telling me that I want or what I need to do or should do and, and really connect to who I am and what I want. And then you start to look at, well, hold on, <laughs> this sounds and feels very different to what I've been operating on for the last 30, 20, 40, 50 years. Because um, people can spend their whole lives living out belief systems that they were they were given when they were four or five and, and they never question it and then worry, worry, uh, sorry, wonder why they're unhappy in their life. Um, but until you you're able to create situational awareness for yourself or have someone else to facilitate and and challenge you and to question why you're behaving the way that you are doing what you do or believing what you believe it's it can be really tricky to to kind of uncover all of those little narratives that hide at the back of our minds yeah it makes me think that one of the things that i think is really difficult is because it's not just immediate outside influence it's like we've had these things in our head for years and years and years so our feelings are battling with our heads there's that like I get that sometimes and something that I've been really trying to uh, do recently is like go with like what's the feeling rather than like what what's the story I'm now creating in my head because normally the story is like some kind of fear yeah. And then it goes to the like, I should do this or I have to do this rather than I want mm. to do this. And I think just going on to the fear thing, because this might bring up some thoughts for you, like a lot of the fear is around identity. And you you touched on that in terms of like, but I'm handstand, Dan. I can't yeah, be yeah. now coach, Dan. And what like, would that mean? I yeah, what would that? And we all think that people like care enough. No one cares, <laughs> really. And like, I think um, I can't remember who said it. Maybe I heard it on a podcast or something. That like we have the right to change our identity as many times as we want to. Like nothing has to be fixed. It's just our ego that is like mm -hmm. saying, "But this is the person I am, and this is how everyone knows me." And actually, shifting your identity. And I've, I've had a few identity shifts whether it's from like uh, being working in TV to being a yoga teacher, to being married, to being divorced, you know, there's all these identity shifts we have and, and that's okay. And I don't know if you mm. have any thoughts around that or any processes that might make that easier where we can step out of that, that fear-based mind kind of story rather than like yeah. getting into our gut. Yeah, so there's this is there's there's a few things that came up when you were talking. Then I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember all of my shadow pen and paper. <laughs> um, so yeah, fear fear narratives are a really really interesting thing. So I'll start there. So there's a another exercise that you can do that's really nice. That's basically what are my sentences, um, and this is where we start to look at stuff like I am not enough, or I won't have enough, or I I'm not enough, or um, who am I to do that? I'm to this, I'm to that, on and on and on and on. And if you just sit down with a piece of paper um, and start to explore, well, what are the things that I believe about myself? What are the things that I, I tell myself regularly that are actually quite negative? Is they often sit below the, the fear narrative. And it's like, well, of course, I'm not going for the job promotion because I'm not good enough or I'll never be enough. And we, we then operate based on these sentences and then that drives our behavior um, because it's quite an interesting thing that if we've believed this for so long and then we do something that proves this wrong, it's like, well, then what? It's like, oh, what? I was, I was successful and I didn't think I was going to be because all of these are protective mechanisms, right? All of, these, all of these belief systems and little things that we tell ourselves were created at a time in our life where we needed to feel safe. And we didn't want to get hurt. We didn't want to be rejected. And so these have been protecting us for a very, very long time, which is why undoing these belief systems and establishing new ones can be <laughs> really, really terrifying because it's like, well, hold on. This has been serving me for a really, really long time. It's been keeping me very safe. And, and then the question to ask then is, is safe how you want to live your life? And 
is safe holding you back? And what's the fear? What if you do something different? It could go terribly, but it could go fantastically. So the first thing I would say is exploring your sentences really gives you a deeper understanding of why the fear is creeping in. It's like, okay, I'm scared about this thing because this thing over here is, is either going to make me challenge one of these things over here, or it's going to prove one of these things wrong. And then who am I without that belief system? If I've been living X number of years on this planet, doing my thing, believing that I'm not good enough or, you know, silver medal is fine or any of these other belief systems that you might start to uncover is you have to prove these wrong if you wish to do something different or you need to unpick all of these if you wish to do something different. So these will inform and really educate you on where your fears come from um, and where it's, where it's being established. Is that fear of success? Is it fear of failure? Is it fear of rejection? And you'll see a lot of fears attached to your sentences. Um, so hopefully that will help individuals start to unpack some of this if maybe they're not ready to work with a coach um, or a therapist which is what I would recommend but starting to explore what are my sentences and then what are my fears can really start to uh, open the lens on why it is that you operate the way that you operate that is one thing that I would say I'm trying to think about could you repeat the question if you I can't remember, remember what I asked now. <laughs> um, I know it was about fear. And, I know it, it and about, identity. Um, I was kind of talking about identity. Okay, yeah, I can, I can touch on identity. Um, so I guess expanding on what I was just saying is in terms of formulated identity is if you have an, a number of different sentences that I touched on of um, I'm to this or I'll never be enough that or I won't be enough to do that or I'm not smart enough is these can really shape the person that you believe yourself to be. Um, and in doing so, then, as I said earlier, it informs your behaviors and your decisions and, and the environment you create around yourself to, to support the identity of the person that you believe yourself to be. Um, so I'm trying to give an example. Let's, let's use Handstand Dan. It's like, right, well, I'm Handstand Dan now. So I, I only have to take upside down topless handstand photos. And any workshop that I do needs to be about handstands or arm balances. Um, and then we go deeper on a level of I'm a yogi. So therefore, I need to eat certain things and not eat other certain things. Or I need to wear certain clothes. I need to get a top knot. Um, <laughs> I'm using myself as an example, but you can see how the, just one little belief system of how I should be complete. I need to wear harem pants and, and sleep in a hammock and travel around the world and, you know, who needs money and all of these other things that I started to tell myself, the deeper <laughs> I stepped into this, this belief system of that that was the role that I need to play and that was my identity and therefore everything that I create around that needs to support it, my environment needs to support it, my belief systems, my relationships. Oh, I'm a yogi, so I need to be friends with other yogis. I need to, I need to only go to specific restaurants, right? Um, I need to do this sort of stuff. What would people think of me if I, I stepped outside of that and did something different? Um, and yeah, that's why it can become a massive trap. Um, and it's why, I was gonna, this is what I was going to share. It's, um, there's a fantastic coach, a guy called Steve Chandler, who's known as the, the godfather of coaching. And he talks about how everyone thinks like coaching is like climbing Everest in your underpants. That's all just like setting incredibly outlandish goals. And like, you know, you're, you're rubbish if you're not setting big goals and it all needs to be big go big or go home and blah 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 blah. and then he, he goes on to talk about that actually a lot of coaching is just like hmm, like what underwear should i should i buy rather than worrying about everest or worrying about hiking up everest in your underpants it's it starts square one and it's why a lot of people because of this belief that coaching needs to be this big like event they come to coaching with the expectation. That it's like, oh, well, I've had belief systems for 40 years. Let's just do, well, I'll talk to you for one hour and like, poof, they'll be gone. We'll just, we'll unpick them and that's it. And it's like, well, you know, if it's taken you 40 years and a lot of work to establish an identity and an environment that allows you to keep believing the stuff that you tell yourself, you better believe it's going to take a little bit longer than one session to start establishing new belief systems and to create a new identity for yourself that you believe is more fitting. Um, so it's quite interesting. So what I would 
long-winded way of saying is it takes a lot of patience and a lot of perseverance to to really work at this stuff so the process i take through people it people through is is awareness and then aspiration and then action and accountability so whatever it is that someone comes to work with me on is usually it will follow this kind of three-step process but obviously applicable to whatever it is that they're they're coming to me about but to keep it to relevant to what we're discussing the first point is well awareness what what is going on what are my belief systems what am i scared of what's the what's the fear narratives what mindsets is that creating what behaviors is that creating within my relationships within my work um and on and on and on and on and then what environment is that created for me and what's the identity that i have within that world within that environment and then going back and saying well the sentences are this i'm, I'm scared of this um, i'm fearful of being successful because i might disappoint this person if i am and you start to unpick all of this stuff and you're like wow no wonder I'm having a really hard time changing jobs. <laughs> the, the seemingly simple thing is no longer simple. So then it's breadcrumb pieces. What can I do? What small thing that feels uncomfortable, but I have the courage to do? And then that building a, a new way of being and enough evidence that you're going to be safe <laughs> to, to be a different way or to live a different way. It's not, oh, I'm over here and now I'm just going to jump and land over here and there's going to be no problems so i talked about a client talked about this to a client recently of you can make big jumps it's not to say you can't but it's like a meteor right and the meteors move from one space to another but people forget about the little tail of fragments that follow behind the big meteor it's like you can do big jumps and you can make quite seemingly large leaps but then expecting there to be no residual aftermath of, of the person that you were before, the beliefs that you had before is going to really trip you up. So it's just having this awareness that this work is always ongoing. Um, and like you said earlier, like I always got mentors or different coaches. It's the same with me. I have, uh, I have a therapist. I have a, a business coach. I have a PT. Um, I have a coach coach. So I've, I've got different people helping me with different areas of my life for that very reason is that the work is always ongoing. And like you said, identities shift regularly and it's, it's completely normal for that to happen because we're always evolving as people and we're in different environments and different people come into and leave our lives. So understanding that it's always changing and you're having to remap and remodel and remold, as long as you're aware of that and you're willing to, to do the work each time that takes place, it's going to be a lot easier and thinking that it's going to be a joy ride and it's going to be you know yeah i'll just see a coach for one session that's fine and then the work's done i'm complete i'm complete i don't need to do any more self-work and that's the thing about again this work it's like it's not the quick fix it's not the pill it's not the yeah. it really is step by step and a lot of work and like for me, it just, and I'm sure you'll really resonate with this, it's like a privilege to be doing it and to be able to do it and be able to have people in my life and be able to connect with people like you and learn so much. And so I actually don't even see it really as work. I just, I see it as like a, a privilege, you know? 100%. Yeah, it is. It is. And this is the thing, it is a massive privilege to be able to, to invest in yourself to, to have someone else come and help you with this stuff. That's why I think that there's, there's a lot of um, great work being done by a lot of people out there at affordable rates. So, you know, they're putting their years worth of information into books. Like Books are fantastic <laughs> things to begin with because it's their life's work in something that you can buy for eight to 15 pounds. And, and again, it's then, well, okay, I bought myself the book. And as you were just saying, right, the privilege now is I'm going to give myself this time. And I think that's another thing as well is that when people have sentences about uh, self-worth and feeling enough and that's that in of itself can be a trip up of it's then it's like, well, do I deserve to be spending money on myself and, and being selfish enough to take the time to, to, to look at my stuff? Um, isn't that a bit indulgent? That's, that's another thing that I come up against quite a lot of people like, well, should I be giving myself this much time? And wow, that's that's a lot for me. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a privilege. 
um, and certainly conversations that I have a lot about people feeling like they can give themselves that time to explore there's even just to explore what's going on and to to see how they might want to be happier or to try something different that in of itself is is a big hurdle for a lot of people just to think like oh no actually i deserve this i deserve to buy myself a book that might make me happier i think also something i've actually been thinking about a lot recently people don't even know that that's like they're putting that hurdle in in terms of like so my membership is 12 pounds a month and mm. i believe i'm like one of the most affordable things out there and i the the main reason i get why people cancel because they put they can write it in like reasons for cancelling and it's always i can't afford it and of course, some people, of course, of course, can't afford it. But it just reminds me of the narrative that I used to have, which was I can't afford it. And now what I realise when I say it is like, I'm not prioritising that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, but I think a lot of people would have resistance to me saying that. But I'm genuinely saying that that's just from my experience that, that I've seen in other people and in me where I've, I've been like, I can't afford it, I can't afford it. Mm -hmm. And it's this resistance to because doing the work can be painful and spending money on yourself can feel difficult. As you said, like, I'm not sure I'm worthy of this or, um, mm. and now it's like all my money goes into <laughs> self growth. Um, yeah. It's that, it's that initial barrier. It's like you are saying of prioritization um, and justification. So to use an example, and obviously I won't name names, but I had a, I had a, a potential client, and it was they had you know they had their initial call and they were like wow this is really powerful like i can really see how this would be beneficial i was like brilliant um and they were like okay and then they came back to me a couple of weeks later do you mind if we have another call um just i want to i want to clarify some stuff and then i want to hear what it would look like to work with you and i was like yeah sure thing so we have another call another breakthrough another insight wow that this is this is really really powerful stuff what does it look like to work with you, Dan? And I tell them what the package is and what it would cost. And uh, no, let's, uh, no, I don't have that. I can't, um, <clears throat> no, I can't, I can't afford that. And I was like, fair enough. Um, if and when you want to work with me, let's, let's have another conversation, you know? Um, Cause we went back and forth about a few different options and it was no, 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 no. Still can't afford it. So I was like, okay, well, I've done my part in being flexible. All good. If now is not the right time, just, if and when you're ready we can have another conversation so i know this person um like friend of a friend let's say and then uh we were in a, a social interaction um i'd say like a week a week later and he bought himself the brand new the brand new iphone um what it was the you know like iphone 12 point something or other with five cameras and, and all the rest of it right and which is fair enough you know spend your money on what you want to spend it on but then to justify that you can't afford something and then to spend um, a large sum of money on something else is, as you just said, it's not about affordability. <laughs> it's about justifying the cost or prioritization, right? Because he didn't need a new phone. He had the iPhone 12.5 and he bought the iPhone 12.6, which for, you know, I'm, I'm saying this in a lighthearted way, but it wasn't a need he didn't need the new phone. It was a status piece. He wanted the new phone and he wanted the new phone more than he wanted to, to do the work on himself, um, which is fine. As you said, you know, people need, it's a classic coaching thing and therapy thing, but you can't coach someone that doesn't want to be coached. Um, and someone that's not ready for therapy can't have therapy because they're not willing to go to the places that they need to go and to access the parts of themselves to do the work and do the healing. So you can't force someone <laughs> into a corner and say, you need it. This is, don't spend your money on the phone, spend your money on me. Um, you can only have conversations and hope that people make informed decisions about, you know, what's going to be best for them and, and improve their life. But yeah, I certainly believe that what you were saying is that for some people that can very much be a resistance standpoint of like, hold on, I've uncovered a lot of stuff and it is absolutely terrifying and I, I don't want to look at it. Like, ah, close my eyes, go and buy a new phone. 
<laughs> um, oh, Dan, I feel like I could talk to you for so long, um, but I'm just, I'm aware of the time. So I just want to ask you one more question, which is what are you excited about um, for the future? And this could be work-wise or this could be um, personal-wise. Oh, I'm excited about a lot. Um, I guess <laughs> work-wise, okay. I'll go, I'll go with work. Um, I'm in the process of developing a few different um, online self-paced courses. And I'm in the process of designing a few different group coaching programs. Um, and the reason for that is exactly what we've touched on in affordability. Um, so I wanted to make tools, useful tools, powerful tools available at many different price points so that people have the option to be able to afford it if they want to. So obviously there's, there's two very different conversations we've had, right? Actually being able to afford it and the luxury and the privilege of being able to do this sort of work and then getting over the maybe the hurdles of telling yourself that it's okay for you to, to spend money on yourself. But yeah, that's what I'm creating at the moment is affordable self-paced short courses that people can do on some of this stuff like values-based work or identifying limiting beliefs or sentences or the sort of stuff that we've talked about. And then group coaching programs where I'll be leading them and we'll have regular calls, regular check-ins. So it's semi-facilitated by me, but it makes um, the coaching experience much more affordable. So I'm really, really excited about, about bringing that to my audience or anyone that's interested um, because one-to-one -one work isn't for everyone and some people prefer a community and a bit more of a group energy and some people just like to do things at their own pace um so yeah and I, i'm playing with the idea of different book titles but that's still very much in a refinement process and men's circles so i'll be starting them soon as i mentioned earlier with john t so there's a few things business-wise on the horizon that i'm i'm really really excited about that sounds amazing and I know, uh, personal wise, you and Evie are going to come see us. Yes, we're trying, we're <laughs> trying to get to Bali. Yeah, we're in the process of buying our house at the moment as well. We're, we're both very, very excited about that. Um, yeah, just excited about life. I think that's the best way to put it. Like, I'm, I'm very, very happy um, with Eve and with the group of friends in the community that I have where I live and the, the trajectory of my life. And, and yeah, it's, I don't have any complaints. What a lovely place to end. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dan. You're welcome. You're welcome. Sorry about all the um, all the headphone issues. Oh, it's all good. We got there in the end. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Not at all.